possible. Take your Bible, if you will, please, and turn to the book of James. Um, I'm going to talk to you for just a, a little while here this morning. I, I won't get near through this, but um, one of the things that I wanted to discuss with you is how to keep a weed-free garden. And we've been talking about the dirt and the importance of trying to take care of the dirt and how important that is. And um, we can't be responsible for the seed. Thank the Lord that the seed is good. I did a little bit of studying on the seed. And, uh, you know, Monsanto came in and they did hybrids and then they did a, what's called a suicide seed where when the seed comes up, it doesn't germinate. So you have to go back and buy seed every year. You know, seed is made that it's supposed to, it's supposed to replenish or reproduce itself. So once the tree dies off or the fruit dies off, the seed's there and then the seed germinates and it continues to do that. And so interestingly enough, in order to keep you to come, to coming back, uh, that uh, they started creating a thing, they called it a suicide seed, that whenever the thing began to grow and, uh, and began to populate itself, then it would die off. And then those seeds would blow over into somebody else's um, uh, uh, garden. And when those seeds blew over there, they would intermingle. And before long, the individual that had regular seeds would now had a hybrid seed. And that hybrid seed would annihilate itself just like the seed it picked up. And I thought to myself, you know something, that's a, that's a great illustration of what could destroy your Christian life is that when the seeds of the world blow in there, the suicide seed, the seed that wants to die off and doesn't want to propagate, and then it intermingles with the good seed, and then before long, you have a hybrid, and then next thing you know, it's not reproducing anything. So in James chapter number four, we're gonna talk about drawing close to the Lord, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a couple of things, and they're gonna be, uh, they're gonna be negative. And the reason they're negative is, is there are certain things that is to your benefit, to stay away from in order to keep your garden weed free. Now, if you don't want to stay away from them, then you can expect weeds in the, garden, in the garden. It takes more time to tend to a garden to keep the weeds out of it than it does to pick the fruit. But if you don't pick the weeds, it'll choke out the fruit and it'll prevent you from having what you have to have. That's human nature. Human nature, ladies and gentlemen, requires you to be very vigilant and constantly keep a, a tab on yourself to watch yourself. And as you grow and as you mature as a Christian, just like when a plant grows, it becomes more hardy in some areas, but more susceptible in others. Uh, you've gotten older. Some of you get more set in your ways and those kind of things, and you're locked down on certain things that you're sure of. They're not a temptation to you at all, but you can become more vulnerable and more fragile in other areas. Uh, for instance, if we look at it physically, as you begin to grow older, you have to stop and think about climbing a set of stairs. Or you have to stop and think about getting home at night late and thinking about the darkness and whether or not you have the depth perception. You think about driving in the rain and things like that. You never considered that when you were young. You don't think about running up a set of stairs. You watch after church is over. The kids run up here to get their gummy bears and stuff. They don't think anything about that. And then you watch one of the ladies or one of the men get ready to go up there and they're kind of watching themselves. <laughs> they're going up the step. And then here's the great thing. They get real dainty when they're getting ready to go down. They're, 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 it's like, <laughs> This is, the, this is balance is what that is. This is, oh, because they already see their self piled up on the floor. And for, for when you get old, falling like that can really create problems where you say, what? Well, you never thought about breaking a hip. You get up, you know, walk it off. You're good, man. What's the problem? But when you get old, it, walking it off, it's like, I don't even know if I can walk anymore. <laughs> Broken hips and broken legs and all that, all it takes is just a slight little twist and you can pop the top off that femur and the next thing you know, you're in the hospital having surgery. And you don't recover from surgery like you used to. When you're a kid, you go over and get your meniscus replaced and read torn and that kind of deal. They're putting you in rehab and before long, you're back out on the field and cutting the rug. But when you get old, you're thinking, I'm going to be with this the rest of my life, man. It'll take you six or eight months just to be able to start walking again. And then you know what happens after you've been injured like that? You'll always favor it. It's all well now, but you'll still kind of be, you'll be careful about that and, and those kind of things. It's hard as you begin to grow older. It's difficult. I mean, you look down there moving some furniture and stuff around here. And one of the guys in a, in a nice way, he said, uh, preacher, we, we got this. And I said, well, he said, I, I know you used to could do, I know all that stuff. <laughs> 
your back's been broke a couple of times and you don't need to be picking this up anymore. And it's hard to sit there and watch somebody, a, a young man, and you have to sit there and you feel like a wimp, man. It's, but you know if you decide to get down there and you grab it the wrong way, you may not be walking the next day. <laughs> now, plants are the same way. Uh, plants get older and they get older and they get susceptible to some things and fragile to some things. Uh, but then they get set in their ways. They become more hardy in other things. Uh, plants are like human beings in this sense of the word. As they get older, they become more susceptible to cold weather. You ever watch older people? I remember the old preacher, he painted a picture one time. It was at his house. I don't remember him ever preaching a sermon out of it. He might have. I, just because I didn't see it don't mean no, nothing. Uh, but what he's got is he's got a guy coming out of the sunlight over here, and he's moving, getting older, and he's getting older, and you see his clothes change. And over here he's got on just a pair of uh, uh, pants and a uh, short sleeve shirt, and he's walking, and he's in the sunlight, and then things are beginning to grow darker and grow colder. And then by the time he continues the, the walk, he's over here, and he's got on a toboggan, and he's got on socks, and he's got on all this other kind of stuff. And uh, the, the title, if I remember, was called The Passing of Times. And he said this, he said, when you get old, you get cold. And so we go sometimes to the prisons and stuff. In the middle of August, man, it's smoking hot. And I'd tap on the door there, and he'd come in from running or whatever, and he's got on a toboggan, and he's got on sweatpants and a sweatshirt and all that other kind of stuff, and wasn't big as a minute, you know. And I'm like, good night, man. It's 100 degrees outside. He says, freezing in here. He said, wait till you get old, boy, you know, like that. Your blood slows down. The blood flow slows down. The blood pressure tends to drop and tends to create issues. Plants are the same way. They winter a few storms and a few uh, cold uh, uh, frost and things like that. They do pretty good, but they're not quite as hardy the older they are. They can't handle it. And all of a sudden that plant that used to bear fruit all the time and have bring out buds, all of a sudden it doesn't come through the winter so good. And so out it has to go in order to produce fruit. Now I'm going to talk to you about a couple of those things. You say, why? Uh, you've shown an interest in trying to keep your garden as weed free as possible. Can I say this to you? No garden will ever be completely weed free until you're dead. Always remember there's weeds in your garment. If you're a dog, there's fleas on your back. Always remember there is plenty of down there to remind you that your garden still needs to be weeded. And if it doesn't need to be weeded today, it's because you weeded it yesterday. You ever gone through and weeded and got everything clean and it looked, man, the dirt looks so good you hate to put mulch on it. I mean, it's raked out pretty and all that stuff. And you go back the next morning and there'll be something four inches high sticking up out of the ground and you're thinking, that was dirt last night. Where'd the thing come from overnight? And there it is. And so you pick it up and then, well, there's another one. And there's another one. You say, what is that? That's how weeds are. Your garden and never be weed free, but you should try to keep it weeded. James chapter number four, Father, bless your word this morning. Thank you for the folks here, especially for this special day. I pray that you'll be with us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. James chapter number four, uh, pick it up if you will. Now you all understand standing in state. Let me just go over this real quickly for you so you don't misunderstand. Brother Jeff, appreciate the help you and your wife yesterday very much. The, you understand that we believe in the doctrine of eternal security here. That means whether people call it damnable or not, once saved, always saved. That's not to condone sin in your life, but once you're saved, you're sealed to the day of redemption. In other words, as we've talked about here before, you have a sinless man living inside of a sinful man. And so as a result of that, your soul is saved. But don't ever consider the condition of your soul based on what you see in the mirror. This thing right here is never where it needs to be. You say, what? It's at enmity with God. It's against God. It doesn't like God. It doesn't want anything to do with God. It doesn't want to be controlled uh, by the Spirit. There will always be a battle. He calls it a war in your members in Romans 6. And then over there in Hebrews, you know, he says to you, he said, there's a war in your members. Galatians 5, the flesh lusts against the Spirit, Spirit against the flesh. You cannot do the things that you would. They war in your members. That'll go on until the day they put you to bed with a shovel or the day that you leave this world however you leave this world by death or rapture. But you need to clearly understand that you're standing with Christ once you get saved. You're sealed to the day of redemption. 
Now, now take great peace in that, great solace in that, to understand that that means that my soul is saved. So even if I am not living like I ought to be living and I wrap my car around a tree and I go die instantly, your salvation is not in question. But your fellowship is something different. That's called your state. Your standing in Christ is, you're there. Seated with Him right now in heavenly places, sealed to the day of redemption. What is my state? That has to do with your fellowship. Your fellowship is, is how you and Him getting along. That's the best way I know how to put it. Two fellows in a ship rowing the same way. If you're rowing one way and He's rowing the other, all you're doing is going around in circles. Does that sound a little bit like some of your Christian life? You say, why? Well, you're not rowing in the same direction he's rowing. He's not going to stop and row in your direction. Amen. And so whenever you feel that going on, you're out of sync. And so when you're out of sync, that means not your, you're not lost. You need to get saved again. You don't need to have one fellow said, you know, we had a great revival down here. We had a woman that got saved and uh, she thought she was saved years ago. She hadn't really been saved. And I said, really? Yeah, she's been saved. She's a pastor's wife and all, but she really wasn't saved. And I said, I said, well, that's pretty interesting, brother. She's been in church all that time and all that. Well, yeah, but see, you know, she, she realizes now the reason that she had had two adulterous affairs and she had a problem with liquor and alcohol was because she wasn't saved. No, she's making an excuse to try to hold on to what she's got right there. She's saved. She's just out of fellowship. But now all of a sudden you can't hold me accountable because I did all those things before I was saved. You've been doing that stuff for 30 years. How you act has nothing to do with whether or not you're saved. Amen. And some of you got saved when you were a kid and you've lived like the devil since. Come on. And somebody trying to convince you you weren't ever saved. No, if you'd have died before that time, you'd have gone to heaven, sure as I'm standing here, but your state's not where it ought to be. Now, I'm trying to relieve you a little bit. I realize I'm hard on you when it comes sometimes to how you ought to live and what you ought to do. That's the right thing to do. But I never want to give you a complex that if you failed, there's something wrong with you. No, if you failed, you're out of fellowship. That's all. But you're not lost. Amen. Amen. Thank God you're saved and thank God you're still trying. Pat yourself right now on the back. Nobody's looking. You're just in your mind. Think about, you did good today. You're sitting in church this morning. Right. As far as I'm concerned, you have an opportunity to get some help because you're in the right place to get some help. Yeah. What about all the people that know they're doing wrong? At least you're doing wrong, but you're looking to go. You know, it's amazing to me. A guy told me on time, he said, Preacher, you know I'm really sick. I said, you need to go to the doctor. He goes, well, I know I need to go to the doctor. But I, and then I talked to him a few days later. He said, you know something, Preacher, I'm really sick. And I said, okay, well, you need to go to the doctor. He goes, I, 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 do, I, do, I do need to go to the doctor. He says, I'm just really, really sick. And I said, well, the doctors don't make house calls anymore. Go to the doctor. Well, preacher, will you pray for me? Sure, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray you go to the doctor. <laughs> I, I mean, if you're sick, at least if you're sick, even sick in sin, you're in the right place to get some help. Well, good for you. You did good. I'm show up at the hospital. Well, you know, there's a big line there, and they're going to catch another disease there, and not everybody's wearing a mask there. Not, who cares? I'm sick. Give me some help. Right. I don't care about the people sitting in the room next to me. There's always somebody there sicker than me. You know, I've sat in many a waiting room and sit there and look at other people and think, man, as sick as they are, you should take them ahead of me, and then I get mad when they take them ahead of me. <laughs> I'm bad about it, man. I'm a baby when I'm sick, man. When I'm sick, I want somebody to give me relief. I know you're not that way. You just sit and suffer in silence, you know. And not me. I'm like, do you get me this? Do you get me that? <laughs> you know what I appreciate about you Christians is, is the fact that in spite of all of us being as messed up as we are, you're still coming back and still trying to do right. So give yourself a little credit. You should be smiling, going, yeah, yeah, finally, instead of him getting on to me. Don't worry, there's not going to be another shoe drop. Just, you, you're doing good? Don't ever quit trying. The Lord is pleased with the struggle. If he wanted you perfect, he'd have just killed you after you got saved. He appreciates the struggle. He likes to see you when you... Fight that flesh and fight the world and fight the devil. He's proud of his kids when you do that. Amen. He's not looking for you to be perfect. You can't be perfect. But you can sure try. Amen. All right, James chapter number four. We're going to talk about a weed-free garden. He says, from hence cometh wars and fightings among you. Come they not hence, even your lusts that war where? There it is. The fight is within yourself. 
Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, ye have not yet, excuse me, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, ye may consume it upon uh, your, long, your lusts. Now watch what happens. There's the flesh in verse 1. Look in verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. There's two of your enemies right off the bat. And James is fixing to tell you how to try to get those things fixed. Well look who shows up down here in verse number 6 and 7. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace unto the humble. Watch what the example is here about the proud. Uh, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Clean your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn, and humble yourself. Who do you have to do? Resist who? Verse 7. How do you resist the devil? Submitting. What is humility, preacher? Uh, letting somebody rule you? Admitting you can't? Bow down before the Lord and say, Lord, take control of my life and be willing to give him control of your life. He said, well, preacher, how do I do that? He says to draw nigh to God. How do I draw nigh to God? You humble yourself. Look in verse 10. In the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. You have to admit you can't do it. You have to understand that. Look in James chapter number 1. James chapter number 1. Now if you're taking notes, and this is something I went over, it's been about six or seven years before I gave this list, and I used a little bit of it at youth camp. But one of the things that you have to recognize is if you're going to keep your garden weed free and keep your dirt clean, it is better to avoid than to resist. Now I realize that's old school. I realize people have different lines or their lines are wider than other lines. I'm not trying to give you a life where you walk on a razor blade. But in 1 Thessalonians 5, he gives you a triple A protection there. Avoid or abstain all appearance of evil. Now, do you think that that's a restriction? No, that's protection. Because it's not long before if you look like it, you're going to act like it. You have to stay away from that. Uh, it's a terrible tragedy, the story about David there. In James chapter number 1, let me give you this passage here. He says, let no man say when he is tempted, he is tempted of God. But God cannot be tempted. And I'm in verse number 13. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own what? Lust and entice. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin with it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's little sin babies. Now that's a fact. That's not just a preacher trying to restrict you and put you down and to, and to wear you out. But what he says to you there is, is if you abstain from that, why? Because it's not long before if you start looking like it, you're going to start acting like it. So the Lord said the best thing to do is to what? Just get as close to it as you can and just keep resisting the tug. No, he said, avoid, abstain, stay away from it. You say, why? Preacher, why do you, why do, you do those things? It's not because I'm spiritual. It's not even because I'm trying to set an example. I'm trying to accept what the Bible says about me as a human nature. My human nature is if I get around that cesspool too long, I'm going to get in the cesspool and I'm going to smell like I've been in the cesspool. Now, you, this is a decision you have to make. I can't make the decision for you. I can't tell you where the line is for you. Well, preacher, don't bother me to do this. Don't bother me to do that. Okay. Some of you, though, you have the... the, you, you have the I guess you would say that the scruples, you have the standards of an alley cat. You're, you're, you're making the wrong comparisons. You live in a really messed up world nowadays. I grew up where kids never, you never heard kids cussing. I grew up in the days when if you heard a kid cussing, like saying some of the words that are accepted nowadays, the kids would get their mouth washed out with soap. I, I mean, that was a good way to get your hind end popped. I mean, but good, man. I mean, I, I, I'm ashamed to say it one time. The horses got out one time, and one of them got around my brother, and I let out an expletive there, and I think it was the hand of God that reached down and grabbed me <laughs> in the shape of my dad. He had a way of doing that, and lifted me off the ground, and right there under that big old oak tree, man, I thought I was Absalom, although I didn't have any hair. I, was all, I had a burr. <laughs> I thought, I'm going to be hanging from the tree. And, uh, man, I mean, he let me have it. Not because the horses got out, just because of one expletive. And, one, and nowadays it's, it's, so, it's so commonplace. I, and I, I mean, 
the first thing he said to me after he wore my hind end out, he said, you didn't pick that up from me. Sure wasn't in our house. And just a couple boys I played ball with, I learned. I didn't even know if that's the proper use of the word, you know. But nowadays, you got it, you know what it is? It's just commonplace. Parents don't even correct it. Parents just, I listen to them in the store nowadays, and I'm thinking, good night, man. You have to be kidding. Very commonplace. So nowadays, you say, well, preacher, that's just old school. You, you live in a different world today. Well, just because it's drifted doesn't mean that he's moved. He, he doesn't move just because the world's drifting into sin. It's still right to tell your kids, don't do that. If you do, there's going to be consequences. I kid, uh, think how I can say this, at the store, and his mama got on to him for taking something, said, put that back on the shelf, and she turned her back, and he made a, a, a hand gesture at her. And I'm thinking, are you, are you, are you, oh, we're fixing to see murder right here. <laughs> she didn't say nothing to him. And then a little bit later on, she's cussing at him like he's a grown man. And I thought, well, lady, you reap what you sow. I don't, I don't believe in that. I believe that you ought to set the example. I don't think you ought to do that. If you watch it on TV and your kids pick it up, that's on you. That ain't on your kids. Uh, take your Bible, if you will, please, and look in, um, oh, Matthew 27. Would you agree with me if I tell you men love darkness rather than light for their deeds are... Did you know that that's a scientific fact? I haven't looked at them in a while. I don't have the access that I used to have, but the FBI statistics have proven that crime rises at nighttime. Who doesn't know that? Most people leave their doors unlocked during the daytime. At nighttime, you get ready to go to bed. What do you, why are you locking the door? Because <laughs> the bad guys are out there at nighttime. The kids out there riding around one night and we picked them up doing some stuff they had no business doing. And there was a young girl that was there with them. She couldn't have been 16 years old, I guess. And she just dumb and innocent and you know she didn't know any better she's just and she's crying and all tore up and stuff like that and she said they told me this would be fun they told me this would be fun they told me i've never done this before she's just bawling man that kind of thing i, I opened up the back door and i said well are you having fun right. no i want to go home and can i please go home and she just she's just crying so they had convinced her that it it's out there, and I said, let me tell you what's out here this time of the night. Roaches, rats, thieves, rapers, murderers, burglars, thug, bad people. And I said, these guys don't care anything about you or your protection to have you riding around out here. And then we took her home and that kind of a thing. And her mom and dad were shocked because they had talked her into sneaking out. And she got away. You say, how'd she get away with it? She got caught. I can tell you about four girls over off of Blanding that went out and they didn't get away with it. The guy got off from the paper mill early and T-boned them and killed all four of them. Good kids just riding around the wrong time of night. Not really bad kids, just doing the wrong thing, wrong time. Dead. Little blonde-headed girl years ago, a guy drove a cherry or candy apple red uh, GMC pickup truck and she got off the trellis there and came down and met him and they took off driving. The roads were just a little bit damp and stuff and he slipped one way and slipped the other way and then his tires grabbed the uh, shoulder there and spun that truck over three or four times. The second time around that girl went out the passenger window. She was sitting next to him. She didn't have on a seat belt. She went out that passenger wind the third time that truck came right down on top of her and then rolled on out there. I can remember, I can see the picture of the guy standing there. He's got his hand on his stomach like this and he's just looking, ain't a scratch on him. Drunk, don't a scratch on him, just standing there like that. And right over here is a sheet over that girl, mashed, I mean, like you'd have just run over with a steamroller. Those days you had to give your own uh, wasn't called a wellness visit. You had to deliver the message and knock on the door and 
Yes, sir, she's right upstairs. Mama goes into the room and opens the door and she ain't in there and man, you never heard such a blood curdling scream in all your life. You say what? Love darkness. Sneak out. Never catch me, preacher. Everybody else does it, preacher. And say the kid was a bad kid and say she was a, 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 a doing un, un, a darkness, just doing stuff she's got no business doing. Wrong time, wrong place. A guy has to live with it the rest of his life. You say what? Abstain from all yep. appearance. I'm pretty sure you're just telling us horror stories. Oh, oh okay. Well, they're true stories. Yeah. I was there. I'm not talking about something somebody told me. I was there. That's been 40 years ago. I remember, right? I can see that youngin's face mashed all over that asphalt. You say, why? Men love darkness more than light. Their deeds are evil. Matthew chapter number 27, if you're with me, look in verse number 45. This is the crucifixion, the, one of the darkest times that was ever in the face of the earth. And Jesus comes down there as a great, great passage to preach out of when you start talking about the effects of sin and come down from the cross and making fun of him and, and those kind of things. It's all there sitting down. They watched him there and wagging their heads and they're making uh, a little of him and all that. And then come down to verse number 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. There's a transaction going on. That transaction that's going on is Jesus Christ being changed into the manifestation of sin for you and I. Come to 2 Corinthians 6. When did it take place? In darkness. Uh, that's the time that you, the trouble happens. Turn down the lights. I'm going to help you with your kids if I could for just a minute. I'm not giving you any Dr. Spock uh, stuff. Uh, just a suggestion to you. Um, make sure your kids keep the door cracked. Amen. I know they got privacy. I, I know that. I, you, you do what you want to do and make sure they leave a light on. You say, well, they're less likely to do something in the light. Make sure, don't, don't be afraid to say, what do you, what do you if, if, if you walk in and that thing is sitting, how are they sitting? They're like this and you walk in and they go. It's, uh, uh, oh no, you didn't. Yeah, not only are you not going to have this anymore, because it's going to be in my, in my room. You say, why? Yeah, you what you think this is, a, a corporation or something, and you got like corporate secrets on your laptop? Mm -mm. Uh, watch what they watch on TV. You're raising a generation, you parents, they've taken your, your rights away in, in, in lieu of the kids. They're all about the kids, the kids. My foot, you're paying their bills, aren't you? Amen. Didn't you ladies, didn't you, didn't you bring that, carry that young one for nine months? That gives you the right to do anything you want to do. You brought them in, you can take them out. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, I'm being serious. I mean, you, you don't like what we do here? Fuck, get out. Don't worry about your reputation. T teach them something. Don't let them take your rights away. We had a doctor's son. We were down here. They lived in this village's place down here on San Jose. And they called, and then one of my guys got in a mess over the deal, and they went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And the mom, finally, he was giving that mother, she, he wouldn't go to school, he wouldn't do this, he had been found ungovernable, that's what they called it back then. I'll think of the guy's name in just a minute here, it'll come to mind, but he's a well-known surgeon. And that kid wouldn't go to school, and that kid wouldn't do anything, he just kept tearing stuff up, and so then uh, they kicked him out of the house, and they uh, locked him out of the house, and then he comes in there and busted out the window with a baseball bat, and crawled through the window, and he's in there and crawls into the bed, and his mother said, get out, you know, and then calls the police, and he says, you can't kick me out of here. This is my house, and they have to take care of me, and this and that and the other. Well, you can imagine where all that winds up being. So now I'm out there at the deal, and the people from, I don't know if they call it back then, they had uh, child protection and HRS. I don't know if it's DFS or what it is now. And then they're all out there, and they're over there talking about, you know, well, this kid has rights, and this kid has rights, and I'm thinking... This ain't going in the right direction. So I'm, I'm going to put him in jail for burglary. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> 
if nothing else, criminal mischief, you busted out a window. <laughs> you know what the lady said? You can't do that. It's his house. I said, it is not his house. It belongs to his mom and daddy. Right. Do you know we wound up in court over that? You know they were defending the kid's rights to break into his own house? He said, so, preacher, that, that's a messed up world. So what I want you to understand is that one of the best things you can do for your kids is from a young age, you teach them, you, 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 you haven't earned the right to be by yourself too much. You have to have alone time. Boy, don't you know alone time is dangerous time? Boy, you better occupy yourself. The, 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 the uh, idle hands are the devil's workshop. It may not be in the Bible, but it's scriptural, man. That'll get you in trouble big time. These kids, I want to be alone and put on my headphones or my ear wop thing. What are the, the there's a name, bud thing, uh, earbud thing and that kind of a deal. And they're walking around and you're talking to them like that. And they're, And you're talking to them, and they're, they're listening to this thing. Can I, you're listening to me? Uh, yeah, I'm listening. Now, see, you may, y'all, y'all may figure that's, that's okay with y'all. But you know what you're doing? You're setting that kid up for failure. And that kid won't do that to his boss, and he won't do it at school. Some school out west, they banned cell phones from, from school. The kids liked it. You know who didn't like it? The parents. Well, I need to stay in touch with my kid. When's your kid going to grow up? I'm not sure how I made it without a cell phone in school. I think, I don't know, I think sometimes when my mom and dad dropped me off at school, now they never said this, but I thought they did goodbye and good riddance for a while. You know? <laughs> I, think they, I, I think they were glad I was gone for a while, man. Now, maybe you're not that way. Your kids are little angels, you know. I understand all that. They're perfect little beings and all that kind of a deal. While they're asleep tonight, you go ahead and roll back and start looking under that hairline to see if you don't find a 666 back there somewhere. <laughs> that kid's going to wake up one day and surprise you. You're going to think something possessed them during the night. It's like, who are you? You know, and all of a sudden they're going, hey, what are you doing? Darkness. They get accustomed to it. It's good to be afraid of the dark. You say, why? Bad things happen in the dark. Preacher, what are you trying to tell me? Just give you some practical advice. You want to keep some weeds out of your garment, uh, out of your uh, 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 garden? You know what happened with the tares and that parable that we've been going over the ground? You know what happened? He said, while men slept, the enemy came in and sowed tares. Well, it's better not to sleep. It's better to keep watch. Watch over your kids. Don't be, don't be ashamed of, of, of tightening your kids, even around here. Amen. You let me know if somebody gets on to you for getting on to their kids, okay? I'll get on to them from the pulpit. Amen. That's your kid, and if you get on to your kid, and somebody dares to say, you let me know, I'll call them out from up here. You say, why? It's none of their business. Amen. And you're trying to correct them. Your kids ain't stupid. They figure that if they cut up in church and stuff like that, that you won't get on to them because you'll be too embarrassed to do it. Tighten their jaws. And then when they get the thing fixed and all that kind of stuff, you let me know. Somebody, I just don't think that you should be doing that in a, in a public place. Thank you. Preacher Jane Smith told me I shouldn't be correcting my kid. Is Jane Smith here with us today? Good. How many children do you have? Do you run an orphanage? Has anyone asked for your advice lately on raising children? Yeah. Didn't think so. Don't ever do that again. You say, but they'll leave the church. Oh, well, think about that. That's their kid. You don't know their kid. You don't know nothing about their kid. Amen. They live with them 24-7. That kid knows. They know when to act up. They'll act up in a store. They'll act up in a restaurant. They'll act up at the church. And they're acting like a perfect angel at home. You say, why? They got your full attention at home. <laughs> but you get them in a public place, they'll take off running like a march hare. And what they need to know is all of a sudden feel that chain yep. yank them back. It's like, oh, 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 yes, ma'am. <laughs> Don't yell how what me in, ch in church. Talk, talk, you talking to your kids. If you want to do that, that's your business. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, talking about darkness, talking about you're usually weaker at, uh, at dark times. Can I say this about that? 
You're usually weaker when the darkness of depression's on you, discouragement. It, it kind of wears you down. You'll justify some things you shouldn't. Uh, do you know statistically that people uh, are, uh, commit suicide because of mental anguish more so than physical pain? Did you know that? You know, the ones that are more apt to do that are preachers and doctors and, uh, believe it or not, dentists and uh, uh, policemen. The ones that are helping other people are the ones that are usually in the top five of doctors. Yeah. You say, what happens? You get discouraged. You get depressed. You get downtrodden. And the next thing you know, you get in that dark place in a dark corner and you want to be alone be by yourself, and you become reclusive. Right. If you see a friend of yours doing that, I'm not saying you, they're sending you signals, but try to turn a light on for them. Amen. Try to encourage them a little bit. Don't push them deeper into the cave. Amen. Your day's coming. Amen. You look in the passage over there about uh, David. David's got all those that are distressed, and they're in debt, and uh, they're discomfited. And that's in a cave, a dark place. God does great work in dark places. If you're in a dark place today, why don't you let the Lord turn on the light? He's the light of the world. He's in your dark place. He doesn't want you in that. Walk as children of the light, not and children of the day, not in darkness. Second Corinthians 6, you all know this passage right here. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? I'm in verse 14. And what communion hath light with? They don't match. They don't come together. Uh, look, if you will, please, over in uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Let me give you this and we're going to quit. We've got a big day today ahead of us. We've got a big offering and got a bunch of folks joining the church. And, uh, oh, there'll be some preaching in there somewhere. This is just, this is practical stuff. He's a preacher, you should be giving this to kids. This is for everybody. I go over this right here, what I'm doing for you right now, whether I preach it or don't preach it. I go over this list of things right here. You can tell from looking at it. I've been over it a few times. You say, why? It's practical stuff I've learned over a period of years, and it helps me. You say, what is it? I go back and I do my checklist. Am I abstaining? Have I dipped the color since this time last year? Am I letting a few things in? Is my music changed a little bit? You know, just a little every now and then, you know, road trip. <laughs> what my little eyes are seeing, has that changed? I saw that. Just a few little words in there, a couple of, is it, has it slipped? I, I, I checked this list. You say, why? I don't know. I'm an imbecile. I don't have it down pat yet. Amen. David's a king. Yes, sir. And all David did was slip one time. We'll cover this tonight if we have time. David missed an appointment. You say an appointment? Yeah. I still keep a day timer. You say, Why? And the time came when all the kings went out to war and David stayed at the house. And he should have been somewhere else. Yes. Amen. I have to have that. I can't just do it when I feel like it. I get back and some of the ladies and all came over for the meeting and it was a wonderful thing and an encouragement and a real blessing. And I get back after midnight and get a few things packed up and unpacked and this and that and the other and hop into bed and sleep fast. And Saturday morning came and it's like, all right, boy, you, you got to go to work. Let's go. You don't think I feel like you <laughs> pull the covers over my head and go back to sleep? <laughs> Y'all wouldn't have said nothing. You said, Preacher, you don't do nothing anyway. We, do, we wouldn't have missed you. It ain't no problem. No, but I have a responsibility to be here. I have a responsibility. A lady said the other day, if things get really bad, preacher, you have a bug out bag? And I said, no. She said, why? You don't think things are going to get bad? I said, I don't get to bug out. That's good. Mm -hmm. I have to stay. I have a responsibility to people that are counting on me to be here that can't bug out. Doesn't matter if I can bug out or not. Should I? 
You say, what are you telling me about appointments, preacher? I'm telling you that for me, it helps me keep my Bible reading on track. It helps me keep my prayer life on track. I hate to tell you, sometimes my prayers, I, look, can I tell you this? It's routine for me to pray when I ask the blessing over my food. It's not, I feel all of a sudden the Shekinah glory is there and then I'm hooked up to God and I got him in one hand and me in the other. And Oh God, bless this food. It's kind of like, Lord, I sure do appreciate it. It's habit. Amen. But I ain't putting nothing in my mouth. Right. Miss mm -hmm. Ruthie made giant cinnamon rolls the other day or yesterday and brought them up here for everybody to eat and that kind of thing. And I'm looking at that thing. Uh, you even, you know, whatever you do in word or deed, you know, to ask God to bless it. You know? <laughs> I wouldn't even eat that cinnamon roll. I'm praying over it. You say, what was it? Just routine. What does it do? It makes me, reminds me. I got to do this. Why? It keeps me out of trouble. I can't allow myself to just be controlled by my emotions or when I feel like it. Now, some of you, maybe you've been in school, maybe you hadn't been in school. Uh, and, and when it comes to different things, I had to study for certain things in order for uh, a number of things to transpire or to take place. And uh, I hate to tell you this, but uh, study and uh, much study makes his weariness to the flesh. I don't ever, I feel like studying today. I had to study because I'm trying to accomplish something. I believe in kids having homework. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't think, a, 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 I'm not talking about hours and hours and hours. I know there's a balance to it. Uh, if they use their time in school correctly and that kind of a deal, but they need to learn time management, I believe that. But I believe in homework. You say, what? Well, sometimes homework keeps you out of trouble. I mean, it's also a reward. You come home, if you were playing ball or something, you get finished with that. It's homework first. And when you get finished with your homework, then you can go. Well, so I had a motivation for getting done with homework. Amen. So, well, that's just uh, kept me out of a lot of trouble. My, my folks were bad about it. And when they said homework, I, do you finish your homework? Yes, sir. Let me see it. Right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> that'd cure you from sucking eggs right quick, man. <laughs> you better have something to produce. Why are you telling us this stuff, preacher? Trying to help you keep a weed-free garden. That's what you want to do, isn't it? Don't you want when the seed goes out that not to have to compete with the weeds? Well, that's how you do it. If I just stay away from those things, then I don't have to worry about trying to constantly battle it and fight it and resist it. I don't have to worry about that. It's much better to just avoid it than it is to try to resist it, especially if that thing's strong. And when I mean strong, I'm talking liquor and alcohol and everything else. Better to avoid it. Father, bless your word this morning. Sure do.